Thank you ever so much, Sarah, and everyone for making us welcome. And we're really delighted to be here. And I know I've spoken to a number of people down on our stand, but if you have any questions, please do come and talk to myself and our colleague Rosemary. I've got tons of leaflets and I'd like to go home with less. So what, as Sarah said, I want to cover is particularly picking up on some of the differences between lipedema, lymphedema and obesity, and then talking about some of the latest um, patient surveys we've done about compression, particular experiences of compression in lipedema, which fits really well, I think, with legs matter and the focus on getting people to support their vascular system as well, because we know that a number of women with lipedema will also have slightly impaired vasculature. And I'm also going to talk to you a little bit about liposuction, which is another key area for us. So I have to say, if you're going to take a photo of my slides, this is a really good one, and you should take a photo of this one, because it's a really fabulous piece. And this comes out of the best practice guidelines, which we worked with Wounds UK to get published in 2017. And there's tons and tons in here of everything from how to diagnose lipedema, managing lipedema, really really fabulous and I couldn't possibly do justice to that in 20 minutes but what I want to do is really talk a little bit about what differentiates lipedema, lymphedema and obesity and I have got some photos in a second. So fundamentally lipedema is very much found in women, it is only very rarely found in men who have um, kind of excessively excess of female hormones. Puberty is the most common time when people manifest lipedema and at the moment diagnosis of lipedema is generally happen happening to women in their 40s on average rather than in puberty so we've still got quite a way to go in getting that right at the right stage we are seeing people who've perhaps been initially diagnosed with lipedema and then re sorry with lymphedema and then re re-diagnosed um, fundamentally lipedema is a very in the main a very very symmetrical condition and that's one of the things that sort of helps us differentiate it. And also, it's very tender, painful fat. People will often be hypersensitive to touch. They'll talk about things like how uncomfortable and painful it can be if the cat jumps on their leg or with children being touched by children. And that very hypersensitive, easy to bruise, cold tissue, slightly doughy. Often people describe a bit like a bean baggy, kind of interesting texture to the fat. That's quite different to obesity, where in the main it's uncomfortable, it's difficult, but it's not painful. And again, lymphedema can be uncomfortable, but generally less painful than the, the fat in lipedema. Um, and so what you see in lipedema, that's better, isn't it? What you see in lipedema is you tend to see a variety of, as you can see, very symmetrical presentations. All these women have lipedema, um, and what you can see is kind of over on the... Um, right hand side as you look at it that lady in the top right's got very significant additional fat deposition in her hips but relatively normal legs from the knee down and that is as much lipedema as the ones next to her with the more traditional ankle cuffing that you see people in lipedema unless they have lymphedema as well as the third lady along does to an extent in the top row because you can see her feet um, generally people with lipedema will be stemocyne negative because the feet and the hands are spared which is why you get this kind of fat cuffing where people have a full limb involvement but because if it's undiagnosed and not optimally managed for a long time you can have a lymphedema component that's where you will then see in some patients a positive stemocyne and that presence of fluid edema in their extremities both hands and feet so that's really kind of I suppose some of the highlights about what lipedema is and how it differs to lymphedema and obesity. Um, you can find out more. Uh, lipedema is in guidelines, guidelines for nurses, and I've referenced the best practice guidelines. You can download them by just going to our website, lipedema.co.uk, and you can grab the link from there. And there's also an e-learning module, which the Royal College of Nurses has endorsed, which is on the RCGP platform. And that's been really good. And the RCGP updated that last year to incorporate all the recommendations from the best practice guidelines. So it really is a great up-to-date overview. And I've talked endlessly about the best practice guidelines. I guess the other thing I would say is these guidelines have been really well received internationally. Um, there's only really kind of the UK, Germany and the Netherlands in Europe who've got kind of guidelines pulling together managing lipedema. And after we kind of brought them out, there's been some really interesting work comparing them. And people like the Germans, who are probably more than 10 years ahead of us in managing lipedema, are actually liking and picking up stuff that's coming out of our UK practice and people's experience in here. So 
I want to talk about compression in particular because I guess compression is one of those things that on the NHS we can do something about for people with lipedema. And sometimes you might think, well, if they don't have a significant fluid edema component, why would you use compression? Um, and if you want to read page 23 of the best practice guidelines, it will tell you everything I've tried to summarise onto one slide um, about the improvement that compression can bring to reducing the kind of discomfort. Because lipedema is often heavy, painful, very tender fat, then compression garments can provide support. And if you're lifting up some of those heavier fatty areas around the knee, for example, it can make mobility easier, which then can make it easier for people to exercise. Um, I tried couch to 5K before I knew I had lipedema. And I was with my husband attempting to jog in the park at about week four or something. And I found that I was jogging in the park and I was doing this, kind of pulling up on my, pulling up on my legs and buttocks because my thighs are heavy for my size and for my weight and it's tender. And I realised that I was kind of holding the sides of my legs and slightly kind of pulling around and pulling up. And I was kind of like, this is probably not a good look in the park. This is probably not a good thing either. And my husband's like, what are you doing? And that's where even smaller women with lipedema can find that that tissue is very sensitive and very painful. So I am wearing my compression tights. Sarah will be very pleased to see. Um, and I have to say, we really do feel it. it is helpful for people in terms of not significant volume, limb volume reduction. Bandaging won't do a lot unless someone has, as you guys know, a significant fluid edema component. But what it will do is it will help reduce any fluid that is there and then correctly fitted compression garments can then help people with increased mobility um, and then potentially reducing the risks of lipolymphedema in the future. So we've done uh, quite a bit of research into people's experiences around compression because when we looked at some of the photos of those legs, they can be quite challenging to fit garments for. And I know there's some people have got some great ideas and experiences. So the, um, on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, that's from our first survey we did in 2014, where we'd got 250 women's experiences of lipedema. And just over half of them were wearing their compression most days or every day. And mainly their issues were getting in and out of garments, the ones who said that's why they didn't wear it regularly. But in that 55%, it was sort of 37% of them were wearing it every day. Whereas if you look at the slightly more complicated uh, graph next to it, which is from sort of four years later, our 2018 research, where we've split it up into sort of different types of garments, you're looking at kind of 50 to 60% of people are wearing, them, wearing their garments for 12 hours a day. So what we're seeing is that if you get the right garments for people, their compliance naturally goes up, and that these were all people who felt their legs were less painful as a consequence of wearing compression. And what's also really interesting is that what you can see is that it, it isn't about a magical, it's not that there's perhaps a magical kind of garment, whether it's flat knit or circular knit or a magical compression class. It's whatever's right for that particular person and their own perhaps combination of lipedema, other edema, their own leg shape, whatever's right for them. We're seeing high levels of satisfaction from people in the garments they're using and in the impact on their own quality of life. So that's really nice for us because people are often saying, well, what's the best option? And our answer is it's your clinical judgment. It's what's best for a patient. What you can get them in, what they'll tolerate, what they'll wear regularly is, as you know, that's what makes the difference. But with lipedema, because it's, um, because it's tender, what we do find is that people will perhaps more often be in class one. Some people will not be able to progress beyond class one garments. Um, I wear class two, but my mum, who is um, significantly obese in addition to having lipedema, she's in class two as well because she just can't tolerate kind of increased pressure of a class three garment, even though, of course, I'm like, oh, you should be really good. Because <laughs> obviously, what would I know? But it's daughters, isn't it? They know everything and nothing. But I really, I think it's really interesting that the multi-part kind of garment combinations, so things like capri leggings and knee highs, the sort of thigh length shorts um, and thigh highs, they can work really well for people with lipedema and they help 
adapt to those significant variations in limb volume because I think that's one of the particular things about lipedema. Some people have got very cone-shaped legs and at that point, that ankle to knee can be so much smaller than those upper thighs. And rather than trying to get them into one garment or one pair of leggings, breaking it up like that into different parts can really help with fitting and also help with application. It's significantly easier getting on perhaps a set of shorts and some thigh highs than getting on tights. Uh, and at the risk of preaching to a kind of pro-compression choir, um, what we found in our, in our research this year was that the overwhelming majority of people felt their quality of life was positively improved by wearing compression. So that's fabulous, because when we were looking at it in sort of 2014, we were getting people saying, I, I, you know, I, I try and wear it about half the time, and you know, they're doing it. And now what we're seeing is that 78% um, of people said, my quality of life's better by wearing compression. And I hope what the previous slides have done is really reassured you, you know, it's been different compression for different people and different compression at different points in their life. One of the really big things, particularly for smaller um, women with lipedema who are perhaps more mobile, is the right kind of garments for exercise. And I'm sure people with lymphedema uh, and other um, kind of conditions give you similar feedback, I guess, Sarah, don't they, around the challenges of what you exercise in, because the kind of compression garments we have are not always great if you're planning on getting incredibly sweaty. And that's definitely something that for us, because we're very pro-compression, our members are sort of saying, well, you know, I, I can go and buy sports compression in the shops, and sometimes that's a lot easier for me in the gym than to wear my compression tights, and I went to wear both. How am I going to do that? And it's a really interesting area that we certainly would like to see manufacturers increasingly working more on, those kind of textiles and textures. So I've kind of talked a bit about um, my story, and I'm one of the smaller people that you'll see with lipedema, and I'm... I, pro I only got diagnosed when I did because my mum is one of those patients that strikes fear into your heart. Um, and she does. My mum is big. She's uh, significantly obese, I think is um, probably a, a relatively polite phrase. Um, so she's got obesity as well as lipedema because my mum spent sort of 30, 40 years wondering what was wrong with her. And we engaged in the sort of behaviours that you engage in when you don't know what's wrong. Mum went to the doctors and they said, if you stop being in denial about what you ate, you could get some help. And my mum tried convincing them, my dad tried convincing them that, you know, we understood how scales and weighing worked and we were literate and we could read. But no, you can't be, you can't have these big legs and everything and be big like you are if you're not, you're not telling us the truth. So when I was about 13, we decided, and now all right, my parents should bear some responsibility that we needed to lie because nobody was helping my mum because we weren't telling the truth. But we were, but we weren't. So my mum used to write her real food diary before she went for appointments. And then when it was coming up time to go to an appointment, we'd get the food diary and I'd go in the kitchen because I'm a lot more mobile than my mum. And then they'd read out the food diary for the day and we'd have a look at what other things were in the kitchen and what we thought people might eat with that. You had a sandwich. Would you think you could have eaten three sandwiches? Why don't you double it? Would anyone eat three? Yeah, but three. What if you had a bag of crisps with that? Let me go find some crisps and read some crisps. Or, you know, a tin of baked beans. What if you had baked beans with that? So we invented extra food. Quite a bit of extra food. And then they were pleased. My mum was being more honest. But of course, then you're trying to cut down on the extra food she's not eating. Probably not in many ways one of our better moves. But it's part of the challenge that women have with lipedema and this recognition about the difference between lipedema and obesity is because it's a complex situation. Um, I think it helped me a lot, I guess, in some ways, in as much as it made me very, very conscious about avoiding weight gain. But as my slide says, I was underweight all my life until I hit puberty. And then very, very quickly, I achieved a normal weight for my height. Um, so I've got stretch marks down through, down as far as the back of my knees. And that is, I have to say, at a normal weight for my height, you know, in the sort of low to mid BMI range for what I should be. But just that rapid, rapid weight gain at sort of 14, 15, I ended up with stretch marks that run down to my knees, all the way up the side of my hips, and then about halfway around to the front of my thighs. It's a good look. It's a really good look. When you're sort of 16, 17, you're trying to get a boyfriend, it's a good look. I recommend it. But that's really, I suppose, just the sort of thing that you end up thinking, well, I went around saying to people, at least I don't have lymphedema. Because about 20 years into my mum's experience, when she had lymphoria soaking through the front of her clothes, the GPs decided she had lymphedema, which of course was her fault for being so big and fat and eating all the pies and the cakes and everything else. But 
it was at least starting to go somewhere, but because my mum's so big, her mobility is so impaired, um, it was very difficult to get the right care. And I think I would, probably wouldn't want to say that mum necessarily has that um, still yet. And I guess what I'd like to do is show you a little video which contains a little bit about our situation. Um, I'm very happy to talk about it. I have had, um, as it says, I've had liposuction for lipedema, and we will talk a little bit about that. But there's very little that, kind of, if somebody has any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them you know, here or, or on our stand. But this is basically oh. the bottom half of our lipedema leg. It's oh, sort of swollen, uh, very, very cold to touch, and it bruises really easily. Um, Anne noticed there was something wrong when she was just 17. She is waiting for liposuction on the NHS in Scotland. It's a treatment for lipedema that's rarely available in the UK unless it's done privately. They estimate that there'll be about five and a half litres of excess fat removed from each leg. Despite countless doctor's appointments, 30 years passed before Anne was finally diagnosed. I think I've been overlooked. Um, I think there's thousands of women with lipedema being overlooked. We're being categorised as obese. These are typical images showing lipedema that has progressed. The legs have become deformed by deposits of irregular and painful fat. It also affects the arms and hips. This shows just how much it can alter a woman's body shape. Experts say it's usually only women who are affected. It's not known how many, but they say it could be thousands in the UK. Researchers here at St George's Hospital in London are working to discover what causes this genetic condition. It's believed it could be triggered at times of hormonal change, like puberty, pregnancy or the menopause. Doctors are also calling for more NHS funding for liposuction operations. For select patients there will be a real benefit and that it's incorrect to say that liposuction for lipedema is a cosmetic procedure. It is a treatment for this disease. Kate paid almost £5,000 for private surgery in Germany. Her mum's life has been severely limited by lipedema, which is thought to be hereditary. I had surgery because I was afraid. I was afraid to turn into my mum. I was really afraid about that negative future and the, the difficulties that some of the friends I know with lipedema have. This is bad, it's painful. Or it's there is one NHS surgeon in the UK currently performing this procedure. He recently met women from across the country here at the Scottish Parliament, but acknowledges he can't help everyone. Women are clamouring for treatment uh, on the NHS. I, NHS, as I say, I don't think has the resources to support that. Um, and I think women have got to understand that it will only be a minority that may get that opportunity. As Anne waits for her operation, she hopes more can be done for the next generation of young women to prevent further lives being blighted by lipedema. Alexandra McKenzie, BBC News. We were really lucky to have the support of the BBC in doing that, and that news article is available from our website. I think it's really helpful. Um, and it builds on the back of the research that we did. I've given some of the compression highlights, um, but we also have the experience of 250 women on compression and, lipedema, and lymphedema surgery. So you're welcome to come have a look. You can download it from our website. And we do have a patient booklet, which we sell for people who are considering liposuction. I think it's really helpful because there's a lot to think about in it. But it's it, the experiences of people, like this is one of our members, Cassie, and she, her family raised the money for her to have liposuction surgery in Germany because she was unable to get funding from her CCG to have it done here. And if you look at that, she's 30 years old, 31 years old in the bottom photo. She's had three sessions of liposuction and she is now no longer receiving any pain management support from the NHS and it's had a really positive impact on her quality of life. And I think that's what we want to say, is it's a real partnership around compression, garments and other support, but we really want to drive the liposuction agenda forward. And thank you. Thank you, Kate. We have got a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone has a question. That gentleman maybe at the back? Who's our mic person? Oh, yeah. Back. Yeah. Okay.
Hi, you, um, you mentioned about the allodynic pain being one of the main barriers to wearing compression hosiery. Mm -hmm. um, have you got any recommendations from your experience about how to get over that? Um, so that's one of the reasons that things like people going into class one rather than class two garments can help. And sometimes um, where people have got solutions that are um, multi-garments, then it can be easier to get someone to start with wearing either, say, just below the knee socks or things like people wearing sort of shorts to start with and adding garments to it. And sometimes I know some therapists have then had patients say in um, a class three sock to the knee and then a, a Capri in a class two, for example, or whatever that fits them with where they've got greater pain and sensitivity, but is managing the fluid swelling. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, I'm aware of one colleague who uses Emla cream mm -hmm. for specific like sectional areas that are painful. I wondered if you were aware of that as well. I haven't heard of that. No, that's, that's very interesting. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, from here, from Leanne. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you've published the results of your of your research. Um, so only kind of at the moment, kind of our um, so our most recent one on compression garments and liposuction. We've just published the liposuction on our own website rather than any journal articles um, as yet, because we only literally published it about four months ago. Um, so we're just at the start of that, and the compression garment stuff. We've done a couple of conference presentations, but we haven't yet written that up. Find those references within your yes. website. Yes, Wonderful. yeah, yeah, you Thank can. You. You, certainly on the on the uh, lip section piece, the compression garment stuff I've gone through, we haven't published yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, there's a question from <coughs> in the middle. Is there any recurrence um, after the liposuction treatment? So at the moment, there's limited long-term follow-up evidence. Um, the British Journal of Dermatology has had a couple of papers, um, most recently, 2015, it's uh, Baumgartner et al., where they, they so it's a single centre, uh, they've got about, I think it's about 100 patients at eight years, and their patients are still showing um, limb volume reduction, reduced pain and sensitivity at that. Um, so they've, they've sort of sustained their results at that point. Um, anecdotally, there is some feedback from people saying they've either kind of gained weight and or uh, sometimes had some lipoedema, they think return so it's 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 definitely not guaranteed it's not a cure because it's removing an acute manifestation but lipoedema is a genetic um, condition and the surgery isn't removing that but it definitely at the moment there's some limited evidence that's positive for the long term okay thank you very much kate